Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Jan Timonofsky, ACM Professional Development and Education Manager. Unfortunately, David Bly, our scheduled moderator, could not join us today. For those of you who um, may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here's a bit of information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a wide range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in a digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown in the slide in front of you. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, refresh your browser or close and relaunch the presentation. If you have any questions during this talk, please type them into the Q&A box anytime and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Aji speaks, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available and check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out. That'll help us improve our tech talks a lot. You may also open the link to the survey at any time from the resources window. You can use widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACM Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we won't be able to get through during the Q&A session. Today's presentation is Learning from Data, the Two Cultures by Aji Busu Dieng. Aji Busu Dieng is a Senegalese computer scientist and statistician working in the field of artificial intelligence. She received her PhD in statistics from Columbia University, where she was advised by David Bly and John Paisley. Her doctoral work at the intersection of probabilistic graphical modeling and deep learning received many recognitions, including a Google PhD fellowship in machine learning. Aji is also the founder of The Africa I Know, a research scientist at Google AI and an incoming tenure track assistant professor of computer science at Princeton University. Aji, without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Jan. Um... Let me share my screen. Do you do you see it? Yep. Great. Hi everyone. Thanks for for tuning in to this talk. I titled it Learning from Data, the Two Cultures. This is not the typically the type of talks that I used to give. Typically I Give a thought when I have a new methodology that I tested on data that works and, and that I wrote a paper about and put it on archive and wanted to tell people about it. Those are the types of talks that I used to give, but this one is different. It's more of an overview talk of the current state of the AI field and um, trying to draw attention to the fact that in AI right now, there are currently two separate communities using two different approach to learning from data. And I think there's there are opportunities there in terms of those two communities communicating to, to drive AI forward. Um, so learning from data is what we're interested in. Statistical modeling is an approach to learning from data. 
in this approach, you start with the data. You're given a data set, you, you specify a model for it, you fit that model on the data, and you evaluate the fitted model on a goal, a goal that you have at hand, for example, prediction, decision-making, discovery, or explanation. And statistical modeling is the setting of Leo Breiman's paper in 2001. Leo Breiman is a famous, he was, he died in 2005. He was a famous statistician who, who's the one behind many uh, influential statistical methods like bagging and random forest and many others. And he also wrote this paper that's now in the statistics literature and that people have commented on, followed up, on, followed up on, including all the famous statisticians like Brad Efron. Um, the paper is titled Statistical Modeling, the Two Cultures. In that paper, Bryman basically, 2001, identified two communities within the statistical modeling field. Each community using a different approach to statistical modeling. And in his paper, he argued for why one approach was better or more exciting than the other one and called for statisticians to, to, to look into that approach and, and embark in solving those types of problems that that community was, was looking into. Um, so in, in Bryman's setup, we are in the supervised learning setup, meaning we have XY pairs, that's the data. Everything he said in his paper in 2001 also applies to settings beyond supervised learning. It applies to unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, self-supervised learning. The, the, the reason why that is free is because in, in this figure where you have input-output pairs, X and Y, if you replace X with some unobserved variable, say a latent variable, you end up in a unsupervised learning setting. If you replace Y as being partially observed rather than fully observed, you end up in a semi-supervised learning setting. So what he said, even though it was not mentioned in the paper, applies also to those other branches of, of, of machine learning statistical modeling. So let's start. We have, uh, we, we are in a supervised learning setting. We're given a set of pairs X, Y, and we're assuming that nature comes up with, a, nature has a process of coming up with that data. Given some X, there's a process that we don't know that gives us the corresponding Y. This is the setting and we are trying to uncover that process from nature. The two cultures that Bryman identified are, are the, follow, the following. The first one is what he called the data modeling culture where you assume that there's a probabilistic model that, that connects the, the, the pair X to Y, the pair X, Y through a, um, what he called a data model. And his view is that these, this approach typically lends itself to models that are simple, that are interpretable, that you can validate through like goodness of fit tests or, or looking at residuals, for example, think about linear regression, logistic regression, where you actually have an interpretation for the estimators you find for the parameters and all those things. And this approach has, uh, is very pervasive to the statistics literature, even, even nowadays where we look at guarantees for those estimators and, and, and asymptotic behaviors and all those things. And he was arguing that we need to, to shy away from this uh, culture to adopt what he called the algorithmic modeling culture. In the algorithmic modeling culture, you don't assume any progressive model. You just, uh, you, you, you just assume that there's a very flexible function that maps the input X to the outputs Y. And this is typically a black box function like a neural network, which is very flexible. And you can evaluate your model looking at predictive performance, for example. You give me a new, once, I, once you fit this nonlinear function at test time, you give me a new X. I can measure performance by looking at the, the output that the model maps to that input, how close it is to its true, true value on a test set. Um, Bryman argued that this is the culture that <laughs> that statistician needed to 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 move towards because they were solving more exciting problems in 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 practice. For example, speech recognition, handwritten digital recognition, and and those types of problems that were not looked at by statisticians. And he felt there was um, a missed opportunity there. I his paper. The reason why I'm coming back to it right now, 20 years later, is because. I sat down and I noticed that actually 
the two cultures that he identified. We now have many researchers working on approaches that 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 take from the two cultures that combine the two cultures. But that, if you look at the AI field in itself, you still see two different communities. You see the statistical modeling community itself, which which has these two cultures and that are now um, th that have a community that bridges those two but also a separate community that I call the task modeling community. I'll talk about that later. And I think there's, there, there are similarities in terms of what he, the, the, um, the conclusions that he drew from identifying new subcultures to, to what I'm going to talk about in terms of AI. Um, I will go on from now to the next 10, nine sets of slides to discuss and highlight few approaches that I think are a nice um, combination of the two cultures that, that Bryman identified. Remember the first one was the data modeling one where you specify a process model for the data um, that, that you have an eye on to. And the second one was the one that was towards flexibility and, 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 um, and, and more of a black box approach. The first example of a bridge of these two cultures is the work in the paper called Deep Exponential Families. This is not explicitly leveraging black boxes such as neural networks, but it's doing so implicitly in the sense that the, the deep exponential families are policy models for data that take inspiration from the neural network construct. A neural network is basically a hierarchical set of layers that build on each other and that hierarchical construct is what's being replicated in the deep exponential family um, approach uh, to modeling data. The hierarchy is uh, achieved here by progressive conditioning. So you have many layers, say big L layers, and to generate one data point from this model, you, gen you, you go through the bottom of the layer, meaning you draw some random variable Z, then you pass that draw through the sets of layers, each one being a latent layer. Everything is latent here. Each layer has a set of weights that are latent variables that are um, that have their own distributions. And you have a latent variable representing that layer that conditions on this, on this weight and on the latent variable from the previous layer. And you do this up until you generate the data, which is the final layer. So this modeling approach takes inspiration from the neural network construct. And the benefit of adopting this, um, this concept is that you're able to learn to discover hierarchical patterns from data. For example, uh, in their paper, Ranganath et al. in 2014 are, are showing um, a set of topics, hierarchical topics from the New York Times set of articles. Here, they are showing two super topics, quote unquote super topics, the government super topic and the politics super topic. This is the topic that you get when you look at the third layer. This was a three layer deep exponential family. When you look at the third layer, you, you, can, you can pick two topics and then you follow the branch for each of those topics in the earlier layers. And they notice that you actually also find topics that are more granular from each subtopic, super topic. Um, this you wouldn't be able to do with a simple processing model like latent Dirichlet allocation, which is another approach to uh, topic modeling that use a, 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 a prolific, um, that that's a pure policy modeling approach. Um, the second example that I really like, one of the papers that I really like in this, um, in this approach of combining, you know, prolific modeling with black boxes like deep neural networks. This is one such paper that I really like here. It's called structured variation auto encoders. Here, what I'm showing is just, uh, you know, you're given a data that's like what you see here in this figure, sub figure A. Um, these black dots, that's the data you're given in. You're trying to learn the density to fit this data. When you use structured variation auto encoders, what they do is you can basically preserve the generative process from a mixture of Gaussians and make sure that each cluster is modeled using a neural network. To, to gain more flexibility. And when you do that, you end up with this fit in little d that's very faithful to what the data looks like. How it goes is that you first sample 
a proportion variable from a Dirichlet. This is the proportion of the different clusters. Then you model each cluster from a normal inverse Wishart distribution, meaning that each cluster is characterized by a mean, a covariance. The mean is from a normal, and the covariance is from a Wishart distribution. That's what this says. And then you generate some the weights of your neural network from some distribution. Then for each data point, you generate an assignment variable depending on the on the proportion that you drew before. And then you you draw a cluster from the assignment. You already have an assignment. You can you can you pick that cluster. And then you draw your data from a neural network that takes that um, that latent as input. Um, so that gives you flexibility and also interpretability because you've combined um, graphical um, you've combined um, mixture models with neural networks in a, in a graphical model. Um, another one that's my own work is that, you know, that I like to use as illustration for how to combine graphical models with neural networks is the topic Karenin family of models. There, you're trying to model sequences. Let's assume that we are in a setting where you're given, you're given D documents and their indicators, each x, x1 here is a document, and s1 is an observed variable that corresponds to, uh, you know, going through the document and assessing whether each word is a stop word or not. So you have a stop word list, a predefined set of stop word lists. These are, for example, the or all the connectors that you know, adverbs and things like that, that don't carry um, semantic meaning in, in, in text. So you put those in a list of stop words and you assume that their indicator is one. If you're a stop word, your indicator is one. If you're not a stop word, your indicator is zero. And that's your observed data documents and their associated indicator variables. You model this data by going through this generative process, by specifying this generative process that says you draw a document D by first drawing a latent variable that represents the global context for that document. So this variable is shared between all the words of that document. And it's called theta D here. And you draw it from a, a standard normal, normal zero I. And then you march through the document one word at a time sequentially. And for each word, you compute some hidden state, HTD, for that for word T in document D. And that hidden state is given by a recurrent neural network which is a neural network that conditions on its previous state and also on the, the previous input word. Um, once you have that hidden state, you can you draw the indicator. It's observed, so we're also trying to draw it. Um, we, 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 we're building a generative model of both the document and the indicators. You draw this indicator from a Bernoulli whose parameter is given by some matrix dot producted with the hidden state. And then you draw the word from a categorical with probability TTD. And that probability has two components. The first one is the local context, which is some word embedding matrix row dot product is with the hidden state that you computed before. That's the local context. And then the second component is only there for words that are not stop words. So for a word that's a stop word, meaning ST equals one, STD equals one, this component, you won't see it because it will end up being zero. But for words that are not stop words, we want to be able to take into account this global context in which that's why you take some matrix beta, that's a parameter learned with the rest of the model, uh, dot producted with that global context. So this is a graphical model that has latent variables combined with recurrent neural networks as a family of model for sequences. And it has been useful uh, for, you know, unsupervised um, document representation learning for sentiment analysis, but also for conversation modeling and hospital readmission prediction. The reason why I'm going through these examples, through these examples is to show that when you, when you actually use the two different cultures, you can end up with approaches that, that give you more than what each one approach, single approach would give you. So this was one of them. And 
Another example that I that I like to think about is the work of Nas Nalisnik and Smith, 2017, where they were trying to devise flexible priors uh, that that are part of a larger prioristic model. So the way they define a flexible prior here is specifically trying to learn reference priors. So those are priors that are quote unquote uninformative meaning that basically they are the solution of a mini, of a maximization problem of a KL divergence from a prior to the true posterior. So they, tra they, they managed to find a tractable objective for that. But what was interesting is how they, 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 they managed to make the prior flexible, meaning that they defined the prior through a sampling process. So it's, a, it's an implicit prior. The sampling process is defined as follows. You sample a noise variable epsilon from some distribution P naught, and then you pass that draw through a neural network, and the output of the neural network is your sample from your prior. And you, 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 you pass that sample as part of your generative model. Here, they considered a deep generative model, meaning one that takes a latent variable Z, passes it through a neural network, and outputs uh, a sample from the conditional distribution of X given Z. Once they trained everything, what they show here on the right side is um, is the the, 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 the the prior that they learned for a variational autoencoder. Those are um, those are uh, an, an approaches to learning deep generative models. Uh, and and yeah, they managed to learn an implicit prior for that family of, of uh, for, for that for that for that approach, which is which is interesting. Another one example that that uses neural network only for inference, but um, leverages a flexible representation of words and topics is work of mine. That's called embedded topic, embedded topic models. What you do here is you're trying to build a flexible model for documents, for, um, for, for learning word embeddings and learning topics from documents. And what you do is you, you represent words in, an, in a low dimensional space and you represent topics also in a low dimensional space of dimension E here. You have K such vectors for the topics and for the words, it depends on your vocabulary. You have as many words as you have in the vocabulary that you defined. And the model goes on, it's a graphical model where that, that uses the same generative process as latent digital allocation, which is a kind of canonical topic model. And it makes changes on the distribution of assumptions so that uh, you have a flexible way of doing inference. So how does the embedded topic model work? You, it specifies the model by specifying a generative process. For, for, for each document, for a given document D, the generative process is as follows. You first draw a topic proportion, which is a vector theta D from some logistic normal. A draw from this distribution, from this logistic normal distribution is obtained by first sampling from a standard Gaussian and then passing that sample for a softmax nonlinearity to get a sample from log logistic normal. Then once you draw this topic proportion, which is per document latent variable, each, later, each document has this latent variable that's shared between all the words. You generate a word for that document, each word for that document, by first sampling an assignment variable from a categorical with parameter theta d, the topic proportion, and then you sample the word from from uh, from a categorical distribution whose parameter whose um, priority is parameterized by the dot product between the word embedding matrix and the embedding of the topic that's assigned to that word. The topic that's assigned to that word is given by this assignment variable that you just drew. So this is a graphical model that uses uh, word embeddings as a flexible way of specifying the likelihood. Um, what's good about it is that on, on, in addition to being able to learn word embeddings and topics is that you can actually see in practice that there's this trade-off between you know um, the, the two the two approaches that Bryman contrasted, one that's that does that does very well on predict, in predictive performance, you know, the black box quote unquote approach, and the other one that that uses a privacy model that's interpretable and everything. Here you can see that trade off very explicitly. What I'm showing is the result of uh, fitting a purely privacy modeling approach, privacy graphical modeling approach, LDA, is the dot the black dot that you see 
corresponds to the performance for that approach. The the diamond yellow diamond uh, 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 yellow diamond corresponds to the performance for a purely deep learning approach, the black box only approach, and the green star corresponds to the uh, the performance for the ETM, which is which is combining these two these two uh, approaches. You see that the purely deep learning approach, pure black box approach, is very good at pre at, 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 at you know predicting, has a very high predictive power, but it's not interpretable. On the interpretability axis, which is the y-axis, is doing very poorly. The one that's purely policy graphical modeling, you see that it has low predictive power, but it, it achieves very good performance in terms of interpretability. You see it tall here. And the one that bridges these two, you see that it lands in a nice spot where it has good predictive power and good interpretability. So this was results on a corpus of 1.8 million articles of the New York Times, defining a vocabulary of up to 2,000, more than, more than 200,000 words. Um, the different boxes that you see here correspond to different vocabulary, the maximum being this one, 200,000. Um, another example of bridging these two these two cultures is this dynamic embedded topic model, which is just an extension of the model that I talked about earlier for corpora that have that have temporal dynamics, meaning that you're given documents with a timestamp for each document. And what you can do there when you leverage this approach instead of leveraging the purely prosigraphic modeling approach, that's for example dynamic latent dish allocation is that you're able to discover topics that you weren't able to discover with with DLDA. This climate change topic, for example, we were not able to find it with the dynamic latent dish allocation. Another big win that you have here is efficiency when it comes to model fitting. You can fit these things very efficiently using uh, structured variation inference with recurrent neural networks, which we did. Um, those were just examples of of works that combined the two cultures that Bryman identified. We started with the data and we found a progressive model and we uh, parameterized those, pro those models with neural networks for flexible representations for the data. And we saw that we were able to uh, achieve results that you wouldn't achieve with either approaches taken, taken, taken individually. There are many more examples that I didn't that I didn't discuss in details, but that, that, that I advise that you that you go over. One of them being the fact that there's 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 a whole literature on explaining predictions of neural networks, ex explainability field. There's a subfield in AI who, who, of, of researchers who work on explaining predictions of neural networks, and what they typically do is they fit the predictions using a linear model. So you can think of this as also a way of <laughs> of trying to um, uh, to 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 uh, to uh, benefit from both approaches of you know predictive power from the black box approach and also explainability from a linear model. Another example is that now going the other way around, um, uh, using generative adversarial networks to for a purely statistical problem, which is trying to estimate the median in high dimension, which is very hard. Uh, and, and there's work actually that appeared in JMLR 2020. It first came 2018, and then they had a second version in 2020 in JMLR. And, and I think that's a nice illustration of also just, you know, having this mentality of leveraging, um, leveraging advances from different fields for solving concrete problems. There's deep Kalman filters, which is uh, an approach to Kalman filtering using neural networks. There's also work by uh, Cunningham of Columbia on, on neuroscience, linear dynamic and neural population models through nonlinear embeddings, and many more, many more works. Um, now, let's recapitulate. We saw we're interested in 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 learning from data. One. One approach to learning from data is to use the data, specify a model, fit it, and evaluate it on a goal that you're interested in. That goal can be that you want to gain insights from the model for decision making. It can be that you want to do prediction. Um, and we saw that there's no need to actually 
use one culture versus the other in that some researchers have understood that and have been working on on approaches that bridge those two cultures and we saw the benefit of doing that but now let's think again about our initial problem learning from data you don't need to start from the data you can you can say i have this task that i want to learn to do and i can use data to help me do that that's another way of learning from data and when you look at the when you look at the ai field right now that's what you notice that's the that's the community there's a very big community around that culture where you start with a task this is the task that i want to do because you know there's pursuit for intelligence there, there are many people who who whose goal is to quote and quote solve intelligence and what that gives them is they have this 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 broader way of looking at problem solving meaning that you have a task and that's what you want to achieve then you go and select data that will allow you to 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 accomplish that task and so you will pull data from many sources and then evaluate now once you once you once you learn to do that task using the data then you evaluate it using say um human evaluation or or demos to to show that you have fulfilled that task and in that culture you have things like leaderboards that people try to uh do well on and and they have so many applications in the, because now instead of looking at i have a data i try to find model for it and fit you you're confined i feel like you're a little bit more confined than if you say you want to do this you want to do that <laughs> i don't know if this makes sense but um that that's what i noticed this is very recent i didn't did it used to to think of it this way but i feel like that line of thinking of saying um i want to start with something um i want to start with a task and then try to 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 find data to help me solve that task opens to a lot to a broader sets of 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 um of problems to solve but there are many drawbacks to that line of thinking and i want to bring um bring attention to that um so yeah when you look at ai right now there's the statistical modeling culture which is the one that we talked about where you start with data you can either use a probabilistic model the the data modeling culture or the algorithmic modeling culture which is black box based that's all statistical modeling but now you have this other approach that i call task modeling where you start with a task and data is there only to help you look, fulfill that task rather than than confine you um so statistical modeling you build the data for you build the model for data xy whatever that model is black box or probably sick and, and, and fully specified or uh, you, you're learning a task in which case you start with a task and you have you may have many modules many parts in your learning that task that define the whole procedure uh so what is task modeling you specify your task task specification you collect data you learn to perform that task and you evaluate um there are many successes to this approach and most of the news that you hear about in ai comes from this uh from this community you 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 wake up one day and you hear ai has accomplished this typically it comes from this community one example of such success is for example summarizing documents you give me you, what you want to do is being able to summarize documents so you go and um collect as many documents as you can find online in here what they did was just take archive papers and consider the abstract to be the summary so they wanted to generate these abstracts and what they did was their their task pipeline was you will see that this is just not this is not just mapping documents to abstract is actually their their modules in in learning to 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 do what they want to do which is summarize documents so it's beyond just mapping x to y whether x is latent or not or y is fully observed or not or partially observed so what they did is you know you have these all these documents you you um have your one module is the extractive summarizer what that does is that it poses a um an indicator Uh, binary a binary classification problem where you decide which sentence needs to go to the summary or not so that's what this extractive summarizer will give you then they 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 collect the sentences given by the summarizer 
with the introduction, the abstract, and the rest of the paper and pass that through a transformer language model, which is another module. And now you fit that, that transformer language model to learn to generate the abstracts. This was very, very successful, and it uh, made a lot of noise, and it came out. The, even the paper's abstract was generated from 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 what from their procedure. Uh, it's this abstract that I listed here. Not going to read it, but it's a very coherent one. Like it's an abstract, abstract that if someone didn't tell you was generated through, what they figured you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it. It looks really good. Another success that um, that was very striking is the Alpha Folder Two work, and there the task is to basically uh, determine a protein's 3D shape from its what's called amino acid sequence. Basically, you're trying to generate, to, to predict the structure of a protein based on its, <coughs> on its, sequence, on its sequence representation. And this apparently is a very big problem in biology. It's called the protein folding problem. And it's if solved, it can it can be a solution to like drug discovery, uh, protein design, and other important problems like that. So this work by DeepMind was one striking example of this task modeling culture doing wonders. Uh, what what what's being showed here on the right side is the performance of the second iteration of AlphaFold, AlphaFold two, that 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 is that has completely shattered performance from all the previously submitted approaches. This is a, a, a competition that they run for protein folding. I think it's held every year. Is it every two years? Every year. And basically they have a well-defined benchmark. So the data is well-defined, well-crafted, coming from uh, people who, who, theorists who work on this field and who, who have worked on it for decades. So the data is, is well crafted here in and um, and DeepMind came up with a procedure to accomplish that task, which is predicting a, a, pro, a protein structure from its sequence. Um, another one that I like as well is DALI. Um, what you do here is you want to be able to generate image from text prompts. And that has many applications, like for example, image search, um, a la carte generation for you know businesses, or aiding in data augmentation in many other applications. What they did is, so the task is you want to generate images from text prompts. They had a 12 billion parameter. Uh, uh, like when you when you look through the whole pipeline, you end up with a, with something that has. 12 billion degrees of freedom, basically. And to fulfill the task of generating images from text prompts, they collected a data set of 250 million image text pairs from the internet. You see here that you, you're not, this is typically how things go. You, you have a task, then you go and collect as much data as you can to solve that task and then, and then go through your, your procedure. What they did here is they turned the images into discrete variables using a discrete VAE, so VQ VAE, that's called. And then they encode the text in 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 its bit form, and then they concatenate these two discrete representations and then feed that into a transformer and maximize some lower bound to look like the hood. Um, this was <laughs> one of the demos that they showed that you can compose shapes and you know, in your prompts, when you say generate a chair in the form of an avocado, you know, you can compose these, these two objects, chair and avocado, to get things like this, This, which is interesting. Um, but like I said before, there are many limitations and many drawbacks to task modeling. There are many exciting breakthroughs and, and developments in this culture, but I think the fact that data comes as a second second-hand citizen is the, is the reason for the failure modes that you observe in this culture. Remember, we were in, in each of these things, you see that you're interested in, in, in fulfilling a task, so you go and collect as much data as possible and if, to, to, to do that task, and you end up with these nice demos, except for the alpha fold problem where the data was well-crafted and came from, you know, 
people who know this domain very well. So this this is not an example of that. But for for a lot of them, like a lot of the the the, the, the tasks corresponding to image generation, text generation, data comes as a second citizen, and you end up with these problematic situations here. This is the output of OpenAI's GPT-3. Even GPT-2 also run through, runs through the same issues where you give it a prompt about Muslims. For example, here the prompt was two Muslims walk, and you let GPT-3 or GPT-2 complete that, that prompt, and you end up with a, with, a, with a text that's very stereotypical and harmful basically automatically associating Muslims with violence. And there are many other um, examples like this. You can you can go try prompts uh, with GPT-3 and see. They have some work that try to alleviate these, these harms by leveraging data. I'll talk about that, actually. But basically, these problems are there. And I think they are due to the fact that, you know, they're collecting data from the internet and without taking account of the quality of the data, what's what's there, what's not there, and and just focusing on 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 modeling the task, on on achieving what they want to do with the task. Another problem with the task modeling culture is, for example, a lot of the image generation methods are based on GANs, and GANs have been shown to drop modes when data is imbalanced. I'm showing you results from one of my papers. Showing that when you increase the when the incre when the imbalance in the data increases, then many GAN variants start dropping modes. That's what you're seeing here, not the green one. That was work that we were proposing to alleviate this problem, so it's not dropping modes. But you see that the other variants, uh, the, whose focus was not um, some of them were like PAC GAN and VGAN, uh, were were uh, were aiming to prevent more dropping. But with data imbalance, there's still this problem that they, they drop modes. And, you know, data in practice are imbalanced. Like, image, you give me an image, a lot of the image um, image generation data set that, that, that I use in vision are imbalanced. You often see um, certain complexions more than, than others, and that's a form of imbalance. And what you end up with is, you know, um, Images of people with certain complexity being dropped more than, than 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 others, and that's a problem in itself. And again, there you see the the importance of data. And another problem with this task modeling culture is that because we're focused on accomplishing a task, we don't hesitate to add a lot of degrees of freedom. So you end up with these models, with these architectures, neural net modules that that stack up to you know a lot of parameters, you end up with these gigantic neural networks, and they have a very large fo carbon footprint. Of course, that's not a good thing. This was a result from um, a study by Strubel et al., and they show that, you know, a 230 million parameter transformer model has significantly, significantly, significantly more carbon footprint than, than, than taking a flight. <coughs> from New York to San Francisco and, and other types of activities. Um, another problem of the task modeling culture, even though there are all these exciting breakthroughs from that community, is that because the focus is so much on accomplishing a task, people become blind on what task to actually not do. So you see sometimes some of these works that um, run these controversial uh, tasks. For example, this one was trying to um, um, predict the trustworthiness using facial features. You would be surprised at how many works uh, are along these lines of questions that obviously for a lot of people don't make any sense and they don't because you cannot, you cannot, there's some things that you just as human you cannot do, let alone uh, an, an AI um, algorithm. So, for example, predicting trustworthiness from facial cues, we all know that that's infeasible. And, and this work, unfortunately, got accepted to nature communication. So there are these uh, controversies around which tasks need to be done and which ones need not to be done. There are no guidelines in place right now for doing that. And I think this is due to the fact that, you know, because there are all these exciting breakthroughs, people become blind as to what they need to do or, or not need to do. Not all tasks need to be carried through. 
Um, another also limitation is that it, it may seem like it's applicable task. You can you can conduct task modeling in any setting, but there there are limitations. For example, for domain adaptation, domain shift, uh, causality. You, like when you want to discover causal relations, there's no there's no amount of neural net parameters that can help you. Some questions are just not amenable to this idea of, okay, I want to do this task, and, uh, and so I'm going to go in and uh, leverage a giant neural network to solve that task. Some questions are not amenable to that, and so that's a limitation in itself. Um, sorry. Um, so... These limitations, I do think that they can be alleviated um, by drawing lessons from statistical modeling, meaning, okay, don't neglect the data, don't just leave it as a second second thought. When when you're dealing with tasks involving image generation or things like that, ask questions of whether the data is representative. Statisticians do, statisticians do that a lot. Uh, looking at using more meaningful benchmarks which would open the door to more broader to broader applications. For example, the, the DeepMind AlphaFold 2 uh, problem. You see here, they had a very they had a meaningful benchmark that was uh, run through a competition that they that they have every year, every two years. I have to check that every year, every two years. This CASP um, um, this CASP benchmark competition. So. Meaningful benchmarks is, is 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 a solution. Looking whether data is representative, investing in exploratory tools, exploratory data analysis, which is one thing statisticians do a lot. They look a lot. They they explore the data more to gain insights before diving into the modeling setting. And I don't think we do that enough in in AI. So it's harder because you know it's higher dimensions typically for AI applications. But maybe investing in in tools for you know visualizing embeddings and things like that. Um, one thing is just not collecting data through the internet, any data that you can get, because you know it's privacy and ownership concerns, and and people don't seem to care about that. For example, the past the, there's there's one one um, method that was deployed by GitHub in collaboration with OpenAI that that actually took people's code without letting them know. So those are ownership and privacy concerns that people get are blind to because, you know, they're focused on solving the task and that's all that matters. And I think that's problematic. Mm. One, one lesson to also take in is baking in domain knowledge. Statisticians do that a lot and I think that's valuable. One thing that they, that they started doing, which was nice, is leveraging domain knowledge as a corrective measure meaning that you ha already have these giant models that are deployed. Uh, one way to handle the, pro the problems that I highlighted is to correct them. So they have this data set that they curated that actually contains some, prob some, uh, some terms that you make sure that you don't want to, um, to, to that, that you want to avoid. And they use that to fine tune the, the the models that are already deployed. Corrective measure is one way, but ideally we would want to actually ingrain, incorporate all these um, precautions uh, when 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 collecting the data or when 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 fitting when, when doing the task. Um, one other thing that I think um, may be helpful and 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 um, borrowed from. Um, from statistical modeling is experimental design. Experimental design, I'll read verbatim what this is, the process of carrying out research in an objective and controlled fashion so that precision is maximized and specific conclusions can be drawn regarding a hypothesis statement. Generally, the purpose is to establish the effect that a factor has on a dependent variable. So important topics here are, are hypothesis statements, experimental control, specifying independent independent variables, selecting which sample goes to or to which participant in, it, in in which conditions, collecting data, selecting valid statistical tests. So basically, in the statistical modeling setting, you have you have a hypothesis that you're trying to confirm or validate one setting. That's one setting. There are other settings. 
and you can you can um you can collect your data by making sure that the way you assign uh, you know sample surveys or things like that the way you collect the samples will make sure that you're guaranteed to answer the hypothesis that you're trying to answer so looking mimicking this process we can think of something called like task design where you go through a pipeline for learning to do the task that will allow you to prevent some um undesirable uh undesirable uh uh, effects uh, from the task. For example, one pipeline that I think may be um, interesting to implement would be, you know, in task specification, you describe your task, you ask yourself whether it should be conducted or not, you specify ways to evaluate success, try to do some cost prediction, and then think about potential failures. Once you run with all of that and you collect your data, allowing yourself to be able to intervene on the data, <coughs> correcting for lack of rep representativity or things like that, minding privacy ownership and things like that. And then once, you, once you're once you satisfied, perform your task, um, which we saw involved different modules and different phases. These modules can be statistical models themselves. Um, uh, and once you're done learning the task, you can evaluate it demo human eval proxy metrics or adding actually metrics for um, adequacy meaning potential the potential failures that you identified trying to have metrics in your evaluation uh, process to assess that and you can allow yourself to loop back to the collect collect data collection part if one of these things break so you run through this loop and then you know deploy this task once everything is in in place. So in conclusion, um, like I said, this was an overview talk of, you know, looking back, try to make sense of the current AI field and noticing that just as Bryman identified two cultures in statistical modeling, which is one approach to learning from data, there are actually currently two cultures in AI, depending on how you approach the learning from data um, problem. So there are a lot of exciting developments in one of the cultures. The, the task modeling culture, the other one being the statistical modeling culture itself. And this, this task modeling culture is driving a lot of these breakthroughs, but there are shortcomings that need to be uh, uh, that that need to be that need to be addressed and taken care of because I think they limit the deployment of AI systems to critical domains and they can negatively affect certain communities communities. I think looking into statistical modeling, uh, methodologies, principles, and, and things like that can help with those shortcomings. And I think that uh, there's a need for convergence between those, these two communities so that we can drive AI forward in a safer manner and in, in, in broader domains. That's, that's what I had for now. Great. Thanks so yeah. much, Aji. Uh, so uh, now it's time to take a few questions, and we have plenty of them. Um, so I'll do my best to see if we can get through a few. Um, one question that we received is, how much data is needed for a task modeling approach? There's no, there's no, um, there's no, there's no, no, uh, that depends on what what task you're doing typically because these require like very um, many degrees of freedom you know these gigantic neural networks and things like that you will need a lot of data you need a lot of data so that's why what they do is usually collecting as much data as they can get data that can that 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 that, that fits that task yeah great um, we've gotten a couple of questions about interpretability. So what is a good definition of interpretability? Is it opening the quote unquote black box, for instance, uh, by examining feature weights, or is it a human centric definition? For instance, a human decides whether a model is interpretable for a given task. There are, there are many, that's the thing. I think there are many definitions of interpretability. The one that I'm interested in, 
for example, I know that there is a whole community around interpreting predictions of neural networks. I'm less interested in less interested in that and more interested in inter interpretable latent structure. So so that's why I'm interested in these latent variable generative models. From the latent variable, they, the latent variables do carry meaning in a probably say graphical model. And so and so yeah, there's not one definition of interpretability. And I think the the ones that are more interesting are the ones that you find in latent variable models because um you know, they, they give you a way of doing a lot of things like controllability and things like that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Saji. Um, another question is, should task modeling be deployed in security as well? In security? What, what did he mean by security? You mean ML security or? Uh, I, I believe that's what it was, but we didn't get an elaboration. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what that, that would mean. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can skip that one. Um, uh, in your work on GANs and their collapse with imbalanced data sets, what steps did you take to mitigate this problem? Uh, we, we simply said uh, entropy regularization is the way to go. That's what we did in that work, and it, it turned out to be pretty effective in how we evaluate it, where, where we evaluate it in, in data imbalance, which is a new thing that we did. People were not looking at that. Um, but also, you know, when you have an increasing number of modes, that's also one another way of evaluating what collapse. And you saw that the entropy regularization approach was very helpful in, in that in, in, in both of those types of evaluations. Great. Uh, here's an interesting question. Where does Judea Pearl's causal approach fall in these two communities, or is it a possible new third culture? I, I like that question because I thought about it when I was making these slides. I don't think Pearl would agree, but I would fit it in statistical modeling. You are still having these structural equation models and things like that, and you um, I, I would fit it on, on, on statistical modeling. You have a question that you're trying to answer and um, uh, fitting these uh, structure equation models. Maybe that's a naive representation of causality, but that's from my understanding, and I'll fit it in statistical modeling culture. Also, even in causality, you know, there's also people like Mo. So a lot of my lab mates were working on using neural networks for causal questions and things like So they were combining these two approaches as well for causality purposes. I would, I would fit it in statistical modeling. Great. Thanks so much, Aji. Well, uh, we do have more questions, but I, I'm afraid we have run out of time today. Uh, yeah. I'd like to thank I'd like to thank Aji again for her informative presentation and uh, insightful answers to the many questions. Uh, special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. Uh, we will uh, make the slides available as well. I know some of you have been asking about it. So if you check back to the talk uh, audience console in about a day or so, uh, they should be there. This talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Uh, also, please fill out our quick survey, uh, which you should be seeing on your screen now. It really helps us um, to get ideas for uh, future topics and speakers. Um, and on behalf of ACM, Aji Buso Diang, and myself, Jan Timonofsky, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. Uh, this concludes today's talk. Bye.